All right, welcome everyone. My name is Christopher Cata, and I'll be your host for this webinar today with Caregiving Matters. Today we're talking about um, home safety, and our guest speaker is uh, Caregiving Matters founder and, and uh, continuing chair, Mary Bart. Uh, Caregiving Matters was founded in 2008, and I've had the immense pleasure of working with Mary in a variety of cap capacities, even as a volunteer uh, for Caregiving Matters. And I'm very, very proud to be in this session today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. Um, what I would like everyone to know is we are recording the session, so it will be available for everyone after, afterwards. If you can't stay for the whole session, uh, we're gonna make it available. And towards the end, around eight o'clock, once Mary's done her presentation, we're gonna take questions. So if you do have questions uh, during the course of Mary's presentation, you can actually type them into the Q&A section within Zoom um, during the presentation. And uh, once Mary's done presenting, we're gonna go through all of the questions one by one and let Mary have an opportunity to answer them for you. And after, after the Q&A, if all goes well, we're gonna see if we can unmute everybody and, uh, and shout out a, a big thank you to Hydro One for putting on uh, this series with us. So we're gonna give that a shot as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary and she'll take us through her presentation and talk about home safety. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Chris. And welcome everyone to our first presentation of our safety, for strategy, safety strategies for seniors program. As Chris mentioned, I am the founder and chair of our registered Canadian charity called Caregiving Matters. We were founded in 2008 and we are an internet-based charity. So we're a little bit different than many charities that you might know. And our mission is very simple. We offer education and support to family caregivers. I'd like to talk a little bit about our safety series and what we have planned for you. I'll show you our schedule of events. I'll talk about how to join our events and mostly we want to make this welcoming, fun and engaging for everyone. So come along with me as we look at some safety strategies for homes. But first, I'd like to thank Hydro One for funding this project. They have been wonderful partners and we're thrilled to work with them. So here is a list of our events that we have planned. There's six of them. So basically for six months starting in June, on the third Monday of every month at seven o'clock, we're going to have a different topic and a different guest expert looking at a variety of safety strategies for seniors. So tonight, obviously, I'm hosting this one. In July, we're going to look at how to prevent elder abuse and elder abuse prevention. And our guest expert will be Detective Sergeant Tanya Tremblay, and she's with the OPP. In August, we're going to look at how can you be safe while out in the community. We're going to look at things like being safer drivers and safer pedestrians. Our guest expert for that one will be Sergeant Kerry Schmidt, and he is with the Highway Safety Division of the Ontario Provincial Police. Now we move to September, and we're going to look at how can we exercise safely. Obviously, it's important to exercise but how do we do it safely? That's a whole other topic. And our guest expert is Anne Klausner and she is with Exercise With Care. In October, we're going to go and look at something that I know many of you are interested in. It's cyber theft and identity theft. So how do we protect ourselves and be safer while we're on the internet? And our guest for that is Tom Scheel and he is with the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center and that is a combined effort of the RCMP and the OPP. And then finally in November to wrap up our six part series, we're going to look at fall prevention and our guest is Linda Eind with chats. So we have a wide range of topics that I hope will be of interest to many of you. So how do you actually join our digital project? Well, if you go to www safeseniors.ca you'll actually go to the page where you registered so I encourage you to go back to that page to register for the next five events coming forward. 
So tonight I would like to spend a little while talking about how can we be safe at home. My agenda is very simple. I'm going to show you a few statistics, talk about safety inside the home, safety outside of our homes, look a little bit at the issue of clutter, how do we make our homes safer for people with dementia? We're going to look at hoarding and a very interesting topic for many, which is technologies, both for your home and for yourself to be safer. And then I'll wrap it up. Does that sound good? All right, let's get going. So first, a couple of statistics. There was an interesting study done back in March of this year. So it's very current information. Uh, produced by Vavita Data and March of Dimes. And what they found is that 28% of older Canadians who live at home have modified their homes for either care or safety. And with that, $46 billion has been spent in the last five years for people to modify their home for care or for safety. And in their survey, they asked some very interesting questions. They said, where do older Canadians want to live? And here's what the results were. 78% said they'd like to live in their current home. Six said they'd like to live with family and friends. Four thought a retirement home would be a good idea. 1% thought long-term care would be the place to be. And 12% are undecided. So that's very interesting. But what it really says to us is the majority, 78%, want to continue to age well at home. So how we make our homes safer is critical to our ability to stay at our homes. And 70% of those people in their survey said that aging in place gives them a sense of dignity. So this conversation tonight is about being safe, maintaining our independence and our dignity and something that's, that we all want as we get older. So I'd like to start with the first idea, and it's really fundamental to our safety. Know your limits. Know your limits. And what this really means is please don't tackle jobs that stretch your abilities. Pace yourself as you work through your projects and be kind to yourself and reward yourself. And where possible, let other people help you with your work. Now I'd like to take a look at home safety. I absolutely love this picture. It's a beautiful home. It's light and bright. The staircase looks lovely. It looks safe. The carpet looks sound. The headrail looks sturdy. And if you notice, there's not even an area rug at the front. They've built um, the look of a rug into the actual floor. So let's take a look at how we can make the inside of our homes safer. Now, think about your stairs. How, how is the handrail? Is it a little wobbly? Could it be a little bit sturdier? Is it strong enough to help support you? Perhaps the stairs are worn and the threads on the carpet are not looking so great. That's a safety issue. And if you have wood floors, Maybe they become so unsafe that you're just going to slide off. And most importantly, do you have stuff on your stairs? Because if you do, that's a guaranteed way that you're going to fall down the stairs. So look around your stairs. If you have things on your stairs, please find a way to move them up or down completely, but don't leave them on the stairs. A few more ideas I'd like to share. Improve the lighting inside your home. Replace your burnt out light bulbs with LED lights. And there's two reasons you wanna do this. One, obviously they're cheaper and they last longer. So if they last longer, that means you have to get up on a ladder less frequently. So you've already increased your odds of living safer because you're up on a ladder less frequently. So even simple things like that, we should be very mindful of. Where you can install lights that have a wider sphere. So instead of lights that just go this way, maybe you can have lights that open up and widen the area that you can look at and add motion activated night lights, even inside your house. Now, how about take a look at your furniture? Is it still in good shape? 
Is it a little wobbly? Maybe it could uh, be a hazard for people. And if you have any area rugs, do one of two things, either get rid of them or tape them down. They are just waiting for people to trip over. So think about, do I really need those rugs? And obviously replace any smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in your homes, at least annually. Clutter, how and why to declutter. Now, as you're watching me, think about the room that you're in. Is there any clutter in that room? Maybe there is. Maybe you look around and go, oh, yep. <laughs> There's just a little bit of clutter here. So let's look at how and why we should declutter our homes. I've got 10 ideas and I think that they're fairly sound and I'll go through them. First of all, establish timelines and goals. Set yourself a goal that could be as simple as, this week I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day focused on this part of my dining room. And if you actually do that, then you can say, I've accomplished that, I'm willing to make it 20 minutes, or maybe I'm happy sticking with 15 minutes. So do everything in small increments. Do you remember the expression, how, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, obviously. So that's how we have to look at decluttering. We can do a little bit at a time, but don't do too much at one time because you'll never succeed. Tackle one area or one room at a time. Perhaps tackle the junk drawer in the kitchen. Or how about your purse or wallet? Maybe even look at your car and say, you know what, it's time that got cleaned up a little bit. So focus on one area. And then as you're doing that, purge duplicates. Have you ever wondered why you ended up with three potato peelers? <laughs> well, I did, and I know why I had three potato peelers, simply because I couldn't find the other two. They worked well, and when I couldn't find them, I bought new ones. So create a sorting system that works for you. And often people like to put things into categories, and a common system that people often use is a category for things to save, things to literally throw out. The third is to donate. The fourth category could be things to recycle. And the fifth is what should be fixed or mended. So if you find a system, then you're much more likely to be successful and go back using that system. The fifth idea is interesting. It's called freeing up surfaces. And that means look at the surfaces in your home where clutter accumulates. That could be places like your kitchen counter that has mail there for weeks. Your dining room table obviously is a great place to put things just because they have to go somewhere. Coffee tables often have too many coffee mugs and newspapers on them. So to have an easy, quick um, solution to cluttering, try and keep those surfaces as clean as possible and use them for only things that they're intended for. And you know, you can make your storage beautiful. These days, there's all kinds of baskets and containers that match our decor. So storage doesn't have to be ugly. There's clear containers that you can see right through. You can put labels right on them. So if you find creative and pretty ways to store your things, it's more likely that you'll be able to find them um, much easier. Ask for help. Sometimes decluttering can become overwhelming, especially if we have a lot and frustration can easily stop us from doing more. But if you ask for help, maybe from your friends or your family, I bet they would help you. Perhaps you are pressed for time. You might be moving or downsizing. There are professional organizing companies who will come in and work with you and help you get rid of some of that stuff so that you can meet your schedule to move to that condo or retirement home. Declutter regular, re regularly. Even if you have spent time and you have cleaned off that dining room table two weeks ago, you all know it's gonna get cluttered up again. I truly believe it's like spontaneous generation. Even without your permission, somehow it's just got all junked up again. 
So we need, we need to be mindful to always be in the habit of getting rid of things. Family heirloom or not. Now, this is a really interesting topic. We all have received things from people that we love. It could be grandma's tea set. It could be uh, somebody's war medals. We all have things that we've acquired. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do I keep it? Do I give it away or do I sell it? And what you really have to do is ask yourself, does that tea set bring me joy? Does it give me a connection to that person? Would I feel really bad if I got rid of it? Would I be unhappy? And sometimes it's good to ask yourself the question. I have, for example, 10 sweaters from my grandmother. Do I really need all 10 sweaters? Probably not. I would keep one of them. But I know my grandmother, for example, was a very practical lady. And I think she would like the idea that those other nine sweaters be donated to some family who could really use them as opposed to them sitting in a green garbage bag in my basement. So those are good questions to ask yourself. What we don't want to do is be driven by guilt. We don't want to keep things just because we might feel guilty if we get rid of them. So the final way that I look at family heirlooms is if in doubt, keep that tea set for one more year. Dust, clean it, move it around, do what you want to do with it. And after the year, come back to it and say, okay, Mr. Tea Set, you've been here another year. Now, is it time for you to move on? Or do you continue to bring me joy and a connection to the person that I got the tea set from? And based on that, you'll know what to do. And here's an interesting idea. As we look at decluttering, take pictures of before and after and show that to your friends on social media. They'll be so thrilled and proud of what you're doing. I encourage you to find a buddy who is trying to do that in their same home. And you can do this together. You can share pictures and say, you know what? Today, I'm going to work on the garage. Do you have any ideas or tips for me to start? So find a buddy who's equally interested in decluttering and you can help and encourage each other as you make progress. So why do we declutter? Well, there's 10 simple reasons, I believe. Number one is it honors our lives today by reflecting our current interests and lifestyles. Perhaps you have hockey equipment or skates or figure skates uh, or ski equipment that you are not likely to use again. So why do you keep those things? They are sure not honoring who you are today or your current lifestyles. They were great and useful 20 years ago, but why do you keep them now? That's a fair question. Decluttering brings us a sense of accomplishment and control. I know I'm always so proud when I get an area of our home cleaned up. I go, look, it looks fabulous. I'm proud that it's organized and looking great. It sure decreases stress and frustration when you can't find things. It saves us time when we're looking for things. It's great when you know where you can just put your hand on something and it's there. Decluttering actually saves us money because we're able to find what we already have in our homes. Therefore, we don't have to go out and buy a fourth potato peeler. So it actually saves us money. Decluttering saves valuable space in our homes for things that are important to us. If that tea set for grandma is really important, then maybe get rid of you know, the old Cuisinart that you don't use anymore and save that space for things that you cherish. And it allows us to confirm what we really want to keep and what we want to throw away. And clearly decluttering makes our homes safer and happier places to live. And fundamentally, I believe it's a positive step to a happier life. So look around your room, think about how you can declutter even one corner of your home or your car, and you'll be very proud that you started that process. And if nothing else, I love this poster. It reads, all that clutter used to be money. <laughs> Think about how much money we've spent 
over the years and decades on stuff, stuff that may not have been a good use of our money. So before you go and buy more, that's more money to be spent. <laughs> now I'd like to take a brief look at kitchen safety and how we can make that part of our home safer. I encourage people to, in, to clean out the refrigerator, freezer and pantry. I must tell you, I was shocked the last time I cleaned out my pantry. I had spices that were 10 years old. Honestly, <laughs> I would have never used them 10 years old, but for some reason I never got rid of them. So go through your pantry and be ruthless. Get rid of things that are out of date. Organize your cabinets to have things within an arm's reach. Make it easy to work around and have it easily accessible. Put in frequently used appliances, dishes away. Maybe you don't use that slow cooker very often. Maybe you use it once a year. Well, you can do two things, put it away and you can use it again, you know, next time for one, one evening, or more importantly, could you give it away to somebody else? You have to be ruthless with your space in the kitchen. Obviously add a non-slip mat in front of the sink because water does splash up and where possible, switch to cordless appliances. And here's a real simple one. Please do not use a chair when you should be using a step ladder. Step ladders are meant for stepping on, chairs are meant for sitting on. And I know we've all done that one too many times. Now, what happens in our homes and our lives in case there is an emergency? I think people in their homes should have two fire extinguishers, one in the kitchen and some, one somewhere else within close reach. And for heaven's sakes, if you have even one, make sure you know how to use it. When you have a fire, it's no time to be looking for the manual or trying to figure out which lever to work. That's wasted time. So I encourage you at some point to take out your fire, fire extinguisher and see if you're comfortable with actually using it. I bet most people have never even tried to make it work. Well, it would be a good idea to do a trial run. Also, create an emergency kit that includes a working flashlight with extra batteries. It should also include some bandages, tape, scissors, and assortments of creams. And within that, you should also have a list of contacts for the people who are important to you and have them on a speed dial. And here's an important one. If you're moving perhaps to um, a condo, know where the exits are in your new building. Your current home, for sure, you know how to get out. But if you're moving into a uh, retirement home or a condo, make sure you know how to get out of those buildings. Now, let's talk about the emergency and what if you yourself are the emergency. This is a whole other topic of keeping our lives safe. So what happens if you have an allergic reaction to some foods or bugs? What happens if you have fallen and you are indeed sore and hurt? You don't think you've actually broken some bones, but boy, it's really hard moving around. And what if you're actually having a heart attack or a stroke? So the question that you ask yourself is, how do I decide when to seek medical attention, knowing that I am right now in an emergency? Here's what some people do. They often call someone to get their opinion. Gee, do you think I should go to the doctor? What do you think I should do? Others go to the internet to look for solutions. Maybe I can find the answer to my troubles there. If you think you need help, do you drive yourself? Is that the right thing to do? Or do you just say, well, maybe I'm going to stay at home and hope I feel better soon. But no matter what all these decisions are based on, I can tell you from my personal experience that when you are in a personal crisis, you are not thinking logically and you are not thinking clearly. So know that what you're thinking might not be the right thing to be doing. So my answer to you is take immediate action. 
go to the emergency room. You know, back when the pandemic was flaring, people didn't want to go to the emergency room. That would have been like the very last place people want to go. But now when numbers are decreasing and we're riding our way through this pandemic, if you need medical attention, please go to the emergency room. They are there to help you. It is not the bad, scary place that we thought it was. So go there. If you can, have someone drive you or call 911. And that really comes down to how far away is the emergency room? What if I get into trouble en route to the hospital? And what if, for example, I know I'm going to be in the emergency room for perhaps three to eight hours that day. What happens if I get out of there at midnight and I have bad eyesight and I don't like to drive at night? So suddenly, you know, you're out in the parking lot at midnight all by yourself knowing you have to drive home and night driving is not a good idea. You have set yourself up for trouble, but if you could have had you know, somebody drive you or have 911, at least you know you have a safe way home. So no matter what emergency and crisis you are in, clearly take no chances and whatever you do, don't guess and don't be wrong with your decisions. And you'll never be wrong by going to the emergency room. So here's another interesting topic around emergencies and being safe. And it's got to do with your medical records, past and present. And we don't normally think about this topic as we think about our safety, but we should. Clearly, if you have a family doctor, they have your records. But I know a lot of people these days, for a variety of reasons, don't have family doctors. So your records are scattered all over the place. I encourage people to keep their medical records, especially if you've been to the ER room or to any specialist, they will print you out or they can send you to your phone or your email records of your visit. You could also put those records on a memory stick up in a cloud or at least hard copies of those things. Have your current and your past meds and medical issues listed somewhere, perhaps on your phone or in your wallet and give the list of your meds and your medical professionals to loved ones, just in case they need to contact uh, that specialist on your behalf. And here's how to be safe legally. And this is really important. People need to have power, uh, power of attorney documents. I know many of you do, but if you don't have them, then you are at risk of not being properly legally taken care of. And what that really means is whoever you have named in your power of attorney documents, do they know what your medical issues are? And do they have a handle on your meds? Do they know where to have your files found if they need them? If they live across the country and your files are at home in your office, that's not a very good place for them to access them. And here's a really important one. Do the people that you have named in your power of attorney documents know your wishes, your values, and your beliefs? Any of us could be in a terrible car accident, um, and those obviously are horrendous things, and those sometimes have difficult decisions for people who are named in those documents. So have those difficult conversations with the people that you've named and let them know what your wishes and your values and your beliefs are. Now, let's move on to this fellow with the cucumber eyes. <laughs> I'll spend a fair bit of time this evening talking about bathroom safety. Clearly it's one of the most dangerous or if not the most dangerous place in our homes. So let's get looking at some of the details around how to make our bathrooms safer. Eliminate throw rugs. I've said that before, but clearly the bathrooms are even more important to do that. Lower the water temperature for the house. I suggest no um, higher than 48 degrees Celsius. 
you can install a thermostatic mixing valve in your home. And what that does is if someone else in another part of the house turns on the shower, you don't get a blast of hot water or cold water coming at you. It neutralizes the temperature of the water throughout the home. Therefore, you don't get scalded. And if possible, install a walk-in tub with hydro jets. More ideas and some more tips, grab bars. This is clearly fundamental to safety. And what they do is they offer help and leverage and balance and what they really do is help reduce the chances of a complete full fall. If you can grab onto part of a grab bar, you might fall a little bit, but you might not go down hard as a rock. So if needed, install them beside the toilet, install them inside and outside of the bath or the shower at any step ups, basically anywhere in your home. It's a great idea to have a grab bar there. And whatever you do, don't use a towel rack as a grab bar. It's not meant for that and it sure won't hold you. Another interesting idea is to install double sided door locks. And what these do is you have the privacy of a locked door in your bathroom, but in case of an emergency, the person on the outside of the bathroom can actually unlock the door and come in and give you assistance. Towel holders, they should be placed within close reach, reach of the sink and the tub and the shower. And their placement too is very critical. So you don't spend time stretching and straining. So put them in convenient places at convenient heights. Now here's a picture, it's an interesting one, of a shower stall. And I picked this picture specifically because it shows quite a few interesting things. Up here, there are shelves so you can store your shampoos and soaps and that's important because then your floor is left clean you don't trip over everything there's a grab bar that's on an angle as opposed to horizontal so if you place it on an angle it does two things one if there are multiple people living in the home and they are of different heights they can grab that bar anywhere along that angled uh, system. So that's very important. Um, the other thing right below it is a soap dish. And around that is a grab bar. And there's a seat there. And it's great to have a seat so you can actually sit down and have a shower. The uh, shower head is um, handheld. So you could actually sit on the bench and give yourself a shower. It saves you from standing and struggling. And then there's an actual grab bar around the handle to the shower. So here's a closer look. I absolutely love this idea of this circular grab bar around the shower handle. And I think that's brilliant. I can envision somebody holding on to that with one hand and washing their hair with another. So they're there and they're safe. And often when we have a shower, the water is a little too hot or too cold. You could easily move your hand from the grab bar down to the um, handle and adjust the temperature. There's a picture of the handheld uh, shower head. So you could actually sit on the bench and uh, enjoy that. The bench is wonderful because it's actually bolted into the wall. So if you don't need or want to sit on the bench, you can flip up the seat and save you more space. And here again, a picture of uh, shelving to store shampoos and soaps. Couple more ideas for you. If you need to purchase a toilet seat riser with grab bars that comes with it, how about reducing the risk of falls in your bathroom? by removing all those magazines and cookbooks, <laughs> extra towels that just take up space, any laundry sitting around that shouldn't be on the floor, and installing tub and shower non-slip strips or bath mats wherever you go. Have better lighting in your bathroom so you can see any obstacles that are on your floors or countertops. And here's a really good idea. Install motion lights in your hallway and your bathroom 
So you don't even have to think about turning the light on. You can just make your way to the bathroom. And where possible, try and keep the floor dry and use rubberized mats when coming out of the shower. Even more safety tips. Who knew? <laughs> if you're going to renovate, have the doors widened to allow for wheelchairs to come easily in and out. And if you're doing that, install the countertops just a little bit lower and have them designed so that the wheelchairs can tuck right in, right to the sink and have easy access to the sink. Take your time, take your time while you're in the bathroom and headed for the bathroom and don't rush because what happens when you rush? Well, three things will happen. Number one, your blood pressure is going to go up and that's going to increase your stress levels and when you're stressed, you're going to have greater chances of falling. And falling is the number one thing that seniors know changes our lives, often permanently. So as we think about our bathrooms, think about how you can make your bathroom safer. Now, my picture's gone. I don't know. I'm going to carry on. Home safety outside. Now take a look at this picture. That's a pretty unsafe looking home. I sure wouldn't want to live in that home. So let's look at ways that we can make our homes safer. Ladders, oh my goodness. This is a really important topic. Use the right size of ladder. Don't stretch to reach anything that's too far out of reach. Never stand on the top of the ladder. It's not actually a step, you know. It's just the top of the ladder. And where possible, work with a second person to keep the ladder stable and in place. And if at all possible, hire somebody or recruit somebody to do the work for you. Please do not go up on the roof. That's never a good idea. And for outside, level any pathways that have shifted and moved over winter. So here we go. Don't let this be you or somebody you love. This man's not looking pretty happy. So stay off of ladders if at all possible. More ideas for outside safety. Add a railing to your front steps. Think about installing a ramp if you need to. Here's a simple one. Replace burnt out light bulbs with bug repellent bulbs. Reduce a tripping by organizing things in your garden, like your garden tools, your hoses, and your planters. Take a look at your outside furniture. Is it still safe? How did it weather the winter? Maybe it's not quite as great as it used to be. And here again, hire or recruit your family to help with any outdoor chores. Now here's a driveway that's pretty terrifying. I would not want this to be my driveway. And the reason I put this slide up is because in our homes, we all know of the weird unsafe things in our homes and we've gotten used to them and we know how to work around them. But we also need to be mindful of people who come to our homes and our guests they don't know uh, about that stair rail that might not be too sturdy. They might not know how terrible our driveway is. Can you imagine being a guest at this home and leaving that home in the evening to try and find your car? That looks like just an exercise in broken ankles to me. So as we look at our homes, don't think about just our safety, but think about people who come to our homes and how safe they are. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about how to make our homes safer for people with dementia. Here's a picture of me with my mom and her name was Kay. I was my mom and dad's principal caregiver for 10 years. My dad died of cancer in 2005 my mom died of dementia in 2008. And I would like to share with you one story that made me really wake up to the importance of how to keep people with dementia safe. 
I'll tell you the story about one afternoon that was life-changing for me and um, an important lesson for me to know how to keep people safe. The plan that afternoon was for me to take my dad down to the hospital to the chemo clinic for some treatments. When we did that, my mom would often go upstairs to have a nap for the afternoon. I never worried about her waking up and leaving the house and wandering off, but I did worry about my mom coming down into the kitchen, wanting to make a cup of tea, and then forgetting to turn the teapot off, burning down the house or burning herself. So what I always did, and especially that afternoon, I went down to the basement and turned the breaker off on the electrical panel for the stove. So I knew she couldn't make a cup of tea while we were gone. My dad and I got back from the hospital around 4.30. And so I went down to the basement to turn the breaker back on so I could get their dinner started. While I was in the basement, I decided to start a load of laundry. When I opened the lid to the washing machine, I could barely believe what I was staring at. I, I don't even have words for what I was looking at. While we were gone to the hospital, my mother indeed did wake up from her nap and she went to the basement. And while she was there, she meticulously lined the drum of the washing machine with glass jars. And that was back when everything from ketchup to mayonnaise to pickles to mustard all came in glass jars. My mom loved glass jars and I never thought anything of it. So to my horror, she had meticulously lined the entire drum with glass jars. And I just stared at it and I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And then I said to myself, what if she had turned on that washing machine? And what if she had put her tiny little hands inside there when she heard the clanging and banging and cracking of glass. And what if we had got home from the hospital and found my mom either dead or bleeding to death from all the glass that would have got caught in her arms. And so that was a real wake up call for me to say, how can I, get, how can I make my mom's world safer? Well, trust me, after that afternoon, there were no glass jars left in their house. So the ideas I'm going to share with you now, please know that they come from my experience and they do come from my heart about how to keep people with dementia safer. Families have four challenges when they have a loved one with dementia. Number one is to accept and understand why a loved one is changing and acting so oddly. We need to learn to manage the dynamics. It's an ever-changing situation. What happened this morning has got nothing to do with the reality of this afternoon. They live in the moment, therefore you're living in the moment with them. And please take the time to learn about the disease. There is a wealth of information from groups, associations, and places on the internet join a support group, they will give you a world of support and information. And really, as we look at the loved ones who have dementia, I ask you to do these four things, to be kind, to be forgiving, because they don't know what they're doing. So don't be mad at them. Be patient and be, support, be supportive and show them that you're kind and caring and always find new ways to keep your loved ones safe, happy, and busy. Sorting, hiding, and hoarding. Well, if you know anybody with dementia, you will know that these are new normal behaviors for them. They sort, hide, and hoard all day long. <laughs> they spend countless hours. They collect things, they sort and rummage through things, and yes, they even hide things. 
And watching them do that can be annoying and frustrating for sure. And sometimes it can even be dangerous, like my mom with her glass jars. So ideas to keep them safe, keep the refrigerator free of spoiled foods. They won't know the difference if things are expired. Learn and check their favorite hiding places and keep them safe. If you need to install wireless door and window alarms in case they wander off, you'll know about it. How about installing a few webcams in key rooms, perhaps their bedroom, the bathroom and the kitchen. And all you really want to do there is just take a quick look at them to see if they're okay. Perhaps they're in the living room watching TV. That's great. Then you can get on with your day if you're not there. And if they're in trouble and they've fallen, then you can call 911 and get into action. Lock up all matches, cigarettes, and barbecue lighters. They don't need those things. Restrict access to medicine cabinets. And if you can't do that, empty them out and put the meds somewhere else. Remove the clutter, especially around stairs and hallways. They just might forget to look down and now they're tripping and falling over things. Keep any plastic or paper away from stoves or microwaves or heaters. They might not remember to take them off of there. And if at all possible, have electric kettles with automatic shutoffs. A few more ideas. Hide or lock up sharp things such as razors, razor blades, knives, uh, graters and scissors. Hide or at least unplug small appliances. Lock up the basement, just lock it up. There's nothing that they need down there. The basement could be covered and full of all kinds of dangerous things. And it could be simply, they might forget to turn the light on to go down the basement, or they might forget that you go down one step at a time and they go down five at a time and boom. So they don't need to go to the basement. Hide or remove all step ladders and stools. They have no business going up on them. They don't need to. So get them out of their living zone. Turn off the electrical breakers on the stoves and microwaves when you're not using them. Remove throw rugs. It's just an opportunity to trip and fall. Keep the garbage cans out of sight and covered up. Boy, those are great places for them to put your cell phone or your car keys. Don't let them have access to the garbage cans. Lock up toxic or dangerous products such as all cleaning fluids and glue. Put even soaps out of sight and out of reach. It's not gonna make anybody, anybody's day better if they you know, had a whole container of dishwasher soap, don't let them have it. They might not know what they're drinking. And disconnect any garbage compactors or disposals. They could turn the button on, which is on the side of the wall and hear the sound. They might not know what it's for and they put their hand down there, just disconnect them. They're not worth having when you have somebody with dementia. Here's a really great idea, create a safe room. This is their zone, it's their place where they can play and enjoy themselves. And inside that room, I suggest you have some baskets, wallets, purses, bags, and all kinds of drawers. Put in there some old keys and photocopies of families. How about having a purse or wallet that's got some expired credit cards, some fake money, even put in some Monopoly money, that's great. Some old receipts and a little comb. They might want to comb their hair. This one I used with my mom, a small portable clothes rack. I cannot tell you the countless hours that my mom enjoyed hanging washcloths and tea towels, simple things on her little portable clothes rack. Play their favorite tunes. Even if they have lost the ability to communicate with you, they do know their music and they do know how much they like it. Turn on their music and they'll start moving around. And don't be surprised if they even know a word or two from these old songs. Have a memory box of special items and pictures. I encourage those to be photocopies as opposed to the originals. Dress up. This is great. People with dementia love to dress up. 
and you can just get into the fun of it with them. Have a bunch of old hats, scarves, sweaters, coats, hockey sweaters, whatever it is, and let them play dress up. You can have a big red boa or a big hat with a feather. They'll have a ball playing with those toys. People with dementia love dolls. They love holding them. I think sometimes they think that they're real babies. So have some dolls, have some doll clothes, some bed linens, a little uh, sleeping area for the dolls. They will just love dolls. And often when they're upset and crying, if you give them a doll, it calms them down and they rock and they hold the baby. Even have some stuffed animals around. It might be fun to have a stuffed animal of a dog and have the dog with a collar and a leash. That person might spend hours walking the dog down the hall and think it's their old dog. And really what you wanna do is experiment with a variety of ways to keep them active and safe. Because at the end of the day, it's their safety that really matters. Now I'd like to switch topics and talk about hoarding. Perhaps some of you have seen the series on TVs that look at hoarding and some of the situations, especially if you've never been to a home, a home where people hoard. Those TV shows can be an eye opener. So I'd like to spend a few minutes to look at hoarding. Hoarding, well, basically your environment controls you. I'm going to look at some ideas around why people hoard, some of the symptoms, causes, and what to do about it. Some of the reasons people hoard are they think the item is unique. This is a one of a kind thing, I better keep it. Or the item might be needed in the future. Well, I know I don't need it today, but I might next week, I better not throw it out. It does have some important emotional significance. Perhaps they serve as a reminder of happier times and it often represents people who are beloved and pets who have passed. There's often an emotional uh, link to those things and people keep those to keep connected to those happier times. People often feel safer when surrounded by things that they save. This is my world and this is how I feel safer. And they don't wanna waste anything. Some of the symptoms to look for are excessive acquiring of items that are not needed and potentially worthless. They are just overcrowding the space. There's too much stuff in one area and they have continued difficulty throwing or parting out any parting with anything. Oh no, I think I'll keep it. You never know when I'm gonna need all those garbage bags. And they have a need to save items and they actually become upset with the thought of getting rid of something. No, 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 that's my stuff. You don't touch my stuff, it's mine. So why hoarding is unsafe? Well, it increases the risks of falls. It definitely increases injury to happen when we have shifting or falling items. Imagine, imagine having a series of tubs lined up to the ceiling. Can you imagine any of those tubs falling on you? You might have a really hard time getting from out from under all those tubs. Definitely unsanitary, unsanitary conditions that do pose a health risk, a fire hazard. How would you ever get out of a room that doesn't have a clear path? You're in instant danger. And clearly there are legal issues such as evictions. So hoarding causes unsafe rooms and homes, unsafe living conditions, conditions definitely causes family conflicts. It also makes us more isolated and lonely. So here's a few ideas to look at how to decrease the stuff and stop the hoarding. Challenge any thoughts and beliefs about acquiring and saving items. Think to yourself, why do I keep doing this? Resist the urge to acquire more items. Stop buying stuff on Amazon. <laughs> you don't need it. If you can organize and categorize possessions, 
think about and work on what to keep and what to remove and why you're doing both of those. Try to be more, more socially engaged and not so isolated. Go out to other people's homes. Do their homes look like yours? Hoarders rarely let people in their homes. They know what they're doing. It's out of control and they don't want people to see how they really live. Find the motivation for change. Why am I going to do this? Is it because I need to have that relationship with my granddaughter or I really don't want to be evicted, so I really have to stop this? Improve, if you can, your decision-making and coping skills. And if really hoarding is a real problem in your life, work with a therapist or a professional organizer. These people work in hoarding situations, and they truly do make a difference to cleaning out the homes and helping people move past their hoarding problems and know that other people are there to help. They really are, and they are not your enemies. They are really trying to help you. So now I'd like to take a little brief look at technologies, both for our home and for our personal safety. So for your home, for example, there are all kinds of wellness solutions and monitors. There's um, solutions for doors and windows, for beds. They can actually monitor if somebody falls out of bed. You can know about that. You can monitor entire rooms. Most of these systems have two-way communications with live feeds and cameras to support centers. There are increasingly numbers of Wi-Fi products for our homes, things like smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, smart water sensors that do two things. They let you know if there's a flood in your house and if the water temperatures are too high or too cold. There's radon gas detectors. There's dimmer switches and light switches that can be used remotely and motion, motion sen sensors for both indoor and outdoor. For indoor, there's also air quality monitors that actually monitor the risk of mold in your house. That's very interesting. There are programmable smart locks and doorbells, so you don't have to actually be home to lock or unlock your door. Smart plugs, this is a great idea. They make standard plugs smart, and when they're smart, they're programmable. Then there are also outdoor wired floodlight systems that now have motion detection and bird's eye view. So you can look at your house from overhead to see who's going, coming and going from your home. More ideas for your home. There are electric lift chairs. So if you have trouble getting out of your chair, it can actually move and help you lean forward as you get up. There are lifts for your stairs, so you don't have to walk up and down stairs anymore. There are all kinds of powered wheelchairs, so they can be charged up and let you get on, um, on your way. Transfer devices that can move you from your bed to your bathroom. There are sliding devices and benches that you can sit on and you can slide and get transferred into your bathtub. So that means you don't have to put your leg over the bathtub and risk falling and slipping that way. There are telephones that have big buttons. If you have a hard time seeing the numbers, there's also phones where you can add a picture of a loved one. Let's say you wanted to phone your sister, you'd have a picture of your sister and somebody would program her number in automatically for you. There are large display digital clocks so if you need a clock on your wall, you can have a big one there. There are adjustable reachers. And what they are is you don't have to stretch too far to reach something. You can extend it and it can grab it and bring it out to you. And even something as simple as a mattress lifter. Mattresses can be very heavy and sometimes really hard to hold up the mattress with one hand and tuck the fitted sheet under the mattress. So with these mattress lifters, they're actually temporary wedges that you put under the mattress and it holds it up. And that allows you to use your hands to put the fitted mattress 
or the blankets around the mattress and then you remove it. It just saves a lot of work and strain on your back. Now here's a few ideas for technologies for you. There are all kinds of companies that sell personal emergency response systems. They are programmable with contacts. Most of them have two-way speakers that, co that connect to live support centers. You can wear them either as a pendant or on your wrist. There's other technologies that are radar based and they detect falls as well as the presence and duration of a person in a room. So perhaps somebody has fallen out of bed. These radar technologies would let you know that person's been on the floor for three hours or that person's been in the living room for 10 hours. That's not normal. And with these ones, there's no pendant or wristbands required. There's no cameras and no listening devices. So that could be of interest to people who have privacy concerns. Bluetooth technology, there's a wide, wide range of products and I've just listed a few here. There are item trackers. You can attach these things to your keys and wallet so you, you can find them more easily. There are even Bluetooth toothbrushes that record and track your teeth brushing. Now you might think that's silly and why would you wanna do that? But perhaps somebody you know, perhaps your father, uh, you might not think he's brushing his teeth too often and you might say, dad, did you brush your teeth this morning? Well, of course he's going to say yes <laughs> and he's going to lie. <laughs> so if you had a Bluetooth toothbrush, you could actually go back and say, Dad, you haven't brushed your teeth for five days. So there is an actual practical use to that product. There's even audio sunglasses that you can hear music and you can make and take telephone calls. And all that technology is built into the arms of the sunglasses. There are talking pill dispensers. There's even talking weight scales. Now, this one's interesting. Clearly, when you stand on the scale, it's going to tell you what your weight is. But I think we could have fun with technology. <laughs> Just imagine if you stand on the scale and suddenly it's opinionated. It might want to compliment you and say, Mary, congratulations, you've lost two pounds. Or it could be a little bit sarcastic and say, boy, Mary, <laughs> you've packed a few on. So I think the idea of having uh, talking scales is really quite fun. And I would love to have one that you could program. I think that would be great fun. There are digital thermometers and pedometers. There's also blood pressure and oxygen sensors. More technology. There's pocket amplifiers. And what they do is they magnify the sound around you. So things are just a little bit louder um, without hearing aids. Adaptive clothing has come a long way. There's ones with big buttons. And for people with arthritic fingers, there's a lot now with Velcro strips. Head lice combs. If anybody has ever had head lice, this is a horrible thing to have, but there are actually battery operated combs that you move across your scalp that not only take the lice away, but take the eggs away. And they come into a little uh, container on the comb and then you clean out that container. There's a world of circular and circulation promoter products out there, sleep aids that have all kinds of color and sound ideas and ways to help manage snoring. People with diabetes, they have a whole new way of managing this these days. There are monitors that monitor the glucose levels, current and future without having to do those finger sticks. What a great idea that is. These things are small, wearable, unit, wearable units that transfer the glucose numbers to a smart device so you can see them or your doctor can see them. They actually help lower your A1C and they tell you when you're too high or too low. So amazing technology. A few ideas around leading edge technologies. There's some that are at home medication smart hubs. So whole hubs dedicated to our safety. And what these do is they connect the medication dispensing along with telehealth and real time patient data. 
So they're all stored in this hub. There are Bluetooth pacemakers that actually connects us to clinics and doctors. There are Bluetooth cardiac monitors, and this allows your doctors to identify and monitor their patients. And here's the trick. They can do it real time and remotely. Amazing technologies. And there are even uh, technologies being built for blind spot sensors for wheelchairs. So you know in cars, if there's a car passing you, it often makes a sound or vibrates. They're building that same technology for wheelchairs so that if you're going to move over you'll and somebody is in your blind spot, this wheelchair will alert you to how close that object is and it will be intuitive with lights and sound and vibrations. So this technology that works well in cars, they're now moving it and adapting it to wheelchairs. Smartphones and smart watches. Well, here we go. These are really embracing new trends in taking care of our health and our safety. There are great new metrics and virtual sharing cap capabilities and truly an ever-growing range of apps for our phones and our watches. And here's just a few examples. For ECGs, for fibrillations, they can tell you when those are happening, but they don't yet detect heart attacks. They can track all your walks and your steps, your heart rate and the distance that you walk. They can monitor your oxygen. They can monitor your gait and stride. And what that really does is it tells you the risk that you have of falling. So watch as these technologies grow and expand rapidly. Other ideas? Well, really there's only an open-ended opportunity for more technologies to help us. They'll be monitoring of various metrics for health issues, all kinds of ways to collect data and analyze the data. Obviously, we're living in a world now that's not going to go back much, where we have live feeds to our medical professionals. That saves us time and money for sure. And what it really does is it lets you and your medical team react faster to what's going on with you. So as I wrap this up, I'd ask you to think about doing a complete home and personal support and safety assessment. And you can do that by asking your doctor what's available or asking your local government health authority. They might have some ideas. Or you can even hire a private firm to come in and do your personal support and safety assessment. I encourage everyone to develop plans, timelines, and budgets to make your world safer. And where possible, enlist the help of family, friends, and professionals. And truly pace yourself and don't make these tasks too overwhelming. Because when you focus on your safety, you do have greater confidences and you have continued independence, dignity, and well being. And don't we all want that? And really, you know, the old expression of home sweet home, really, it can be and it should be home safe home. Now, I thought I would tell you a little bit about this. On our website, we have on our homepage um, a post about some of my articles. I have been a regular contributor to a Canadian magazine called Caregiver Solutions since 2010. So on our homepage, our team has posted a blog which lists 16, links to 16 of my articles that I have written for this magazine. And here's just a, a sample of some of them that you might want to go back and look at um, perhaps tomorrow. All are around safety and lifestyle issues for seniors. I've written a lot about home safety and being safe out in the community. Cannabis, that's a very interesting topic for seniors as well as drinking. Rural aging in place, I can tell you, it's not for sissies, but I have a lot of insight on the pros and cons of living in a rural area and how do we live alone successfully as we get older. And I encourage you to read my articles about the importance of having friends and staying socially engaged as we age. And where you find that is our website, 
which is www.caregivingmatters.ca. So to wrap up, I'd just like to review where we are in our six part series tonight. I've talked about home safety and safety technologies. In July, we're going to look at elder abuse prevention. August, we're going to look at being safe out in the community. September, we're going to look at exercising safely. Cyber safety and identity theft is our topic for October. And finally in November, our last one is fall prevention. I encourage you to go to our site to register for all of these or any of them that is of interest to you. And that is www.safeseniors.ca. So I thank you for joining me this evening. I hope I have shared some ideas with you and really what it means is how do we live our lives well and safely. So safety first, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I was hoping to be able to um, open it up to everyone to say thank you to Hydro One, but it, uh, it looks like I can't actually unmute everybody at once. So we'll have to forego that, but I do have a plan for the next session. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> we have a strategy for that. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, we don't have any right now. So I did want to ask you one parting question, Mary. Um, I, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Um, the hardest thing about doing any, any project for me is, is actually getting started. And um, in the context of this discussion, what, what's your recommendation on the, the, the one thing that might be the easiest or the most straightforward thing for our listeners to do in order to get started in this process of, of making their home safe? I think what we really have to do is be honest and be honest with ourselves and be honest with how our world is looking. Is it really as safe as we think it is? And if in doubt, ask a loved one if there's something that you think they could do to help you be safer. So I think it starts with honest conversations and honest thoughts about, I really want to stay in my home and I know this is where I wanna be for the next X number of years. What am I going to do to ensure that that happens? How am I going to take control of my life and ensure that I have continued dignity and independence? And you know, Chris, I don't care if a person is 92 or two years old, mm -hmm. we all fight for our independence. And our independence has a lot to do with how safely we live our lives. And much of our lives, we live at home. So having those honest conversations with ourselves, it sounds frivolous, but it's really, when in my life am I going to take my safety more seriously than I should now? That's my answer. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary. I think we're, oh, I, we do have one question just came in from, uh, from Melanie. Uh, Melanie says, uh, my mom is 88 and a smoker living at home. Are there any Bluetooth technologies that can monitor the risk of falling asleep with a cigarette lit? Well, yes, and there's actually um, things that you can put on the bed to monitor not only if the cigarette falls um, and if she falls asleep. So the answer is yes, there are. And if she sends me an email, at mary at caregivingmatters.ca, I can give her some direct ideas about um, some ways to help her mom um, because that's a terrifying situation. Mommy's in bed and she falls asleep. That doesn't end well. So Melanie, if you would like to email me, I'd be happy to send you some ideas and some technology solutions that might be worth trying. And honestly, anything would be worth trying because it's not likely your mom's going to stop smoking at this point in her life. So using some technologies uh, to help her and also to help you with the stress of that would be wonderful. I'd be happy to send that back to you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Mary. That, Melanie, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, we don't have any further questions at this time, uh, but what I will do is um, um, we will be uh, posting a recording of the webinar on the caregivingmatters.ca website. And uh, once that's ready, sometime over the next few days, uh, we'll send out an email notification to everyone that registered and participated so that you can um, uh, get access to the recording and even review it or, or share that link out with other uh, friends and family that you might want to, uh, to actually see the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We hope Thank you. for the next one. Bye, everyone. Good night.